Hey everyone, it's Classic DM, and I want to make this guide for people trying to get started in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Now, who's the target audience on this, right? You've got people that have played 5th edition who've never played 4th or never played 3.5, who are relatively new, like started playing D&D, &D, uh, 5th edition maybe 2014 when it came out, who've never played the old school AD&D. This video is for you. Um, you may have people that play Pathfinder 1 and Pathfinder 2 who've maybe seen some of my videos because I cover Pathfinder 2 a lot. But they, they never really actually played AD&D. They were too young or they just no one ever played it. This video is for you. Lastly, there's a lot of guys around my age group who played it when we were kids, you know, when the stuff first came out. And, you know, life happened. And we've been working and families and doing this other stuff. And now we're kind of like, hey, you know, uh, I'd like to get back and play in like AD&D again like I did when I was a kid back in, you know, 1977, 78, 79, 80, etc. This video is for you. So... I'm not going to roll up a character, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to roll up a character. You can figure that out. Let's tell you what you need to get started. Okay, so these three books here are the reprints that were remastered in 2012. Some guys who worked at CCP, the game development company that does EVE Online, had an office in Stone Mountain, Georgia area around the time that I was working in that area at Tripwire on Killing Floor 1 and Killing Floor 2 and Rising Storm and Red Orchestra and all that business. Some of the guys there got hired by Wizards of the Coast to reformat, clean up the original Advanced Dungeons and Dragons uh, Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and the Monster Manual. And they also subsequently went on to do things like the Slaver series was remastered and some other books were mastered as well. And this was an incredible thing because as you've probably seen, if you've dabbled in trying to get a copy of your books, they're like these collector items on eBay that people want like $250 for. That's just stupid. So you can just buy these in PDF or print. If you saw the cover of this video, those are print on demand from Drive-Thru RPG. They are not very expensive. So I highly recommend if you're interested in getting back, recapturing your youth, or trying Advanced Dungeons & Dragons out for the first time, go to the DMs Guild, preferably, because their prices are more consistent, and get PDF copies of these three basic books. Or, you know, if you're an old guy like me and you like to have the print version, get the print version, okay? So that's simple. The second thing, the second thing you're going to want to do is, if you really want to get into it, like maybe run an adventure for your family, your kids, or someone else, you definitely want to get the Monster Manual, too. And you want to get Fiend Folio, because in personal, my personal preference is the Fiend Folio is far superior to Monster Manual 2. Monster Manual 2 is okay, but Fiend Folio is really, really, really creative. I would say it's probably the best Monster Manual ever created. And the, the fellow that did a lot of the art in that passed away this year, which is really sad. And his art in this book was incredible. It's a compilation of monsters from the United Kingdom community, which is really interesting. A lot more interesting thoughts, ideas, not as much just ripping off Greek mythology. So get those first three books. Think about one of these two here as well, right? And you can get them as PDFs. You get the theme folio as a reprint, but it's going to be a softback. The first three main, the brown ones you saw on the cover, they're hardback. But Monster Manual 2 isn't being offered as a print on demand at drive through RPG because it's not that good. Okay. Now, on the right here, you see this tiny little picture for the World of Greyhawk. That's a later cover. You really, really, really should. If you want to recapture that youth, you should get a copy of the uh, World of Greyhawk because the massive map done by Darlene is just a classic. And the really great thing is that all the modules pretty much from like 1977 to maybe 83 or so, 84, all take place in the world of Greyhawk. So if you have the world of Greyhawk, you've got this great gazetteer that uh, tells you all about the factions and the kings and the lords. And then when you get a dungeon like Tomb of Horrors or White Plume Mountain that we recently did videos for, it talks about where these places are. Now in the modern day, Anna B. Meyer, who's this total professional cartographer, has remade all of Greyhawk. So you don't really need to buy it, but you get the PDF copy of the World of Greyhawk book. You get all the information about all the different countries and all the different rulers and the different lands. So this is a zoom in on the Nidir River. Uh, excuse me, I keep calling it a river. It's a lake and, the, and Castle Greyhawk and Greyhawk. So her maps are incredible. And of course, there's the same kind of thing available for the Forgotten Realms. But giving you a tip on how to get started, you could get a copy of the campaign set, and you would get a copy of a map that kind of looks like this one on the right. But the Forgotten Realms maps were a little bit on the lame side. 
I remember when they first came out, the folding map, I was like, what the hell? It's all empty. There's nothing in it. Over time, because of so many novels and so many books have been written that take place in the Forgotten Realms. I mean, this is where the Dritt Stewart and stuff comes from and Tantris and all these other books, right? All these different wonderful novels happened in like 1986, 87, 88, 89. They kept adding and adding and adding. And when second edition really took off, tons of content for like 15 years happens in the Forgotten Realms. Even today, in D&D 5th edition, you've got stuff happening in the Forgotten Realms. But, this is the secret. This book to the left, which was done by Karen Wynn Fonstad. Now, she's passed away now for a long time, like 17 years ago. But, she was an amazing cartographer. And she also did a book just like this for, the, for Middle Earth. So, if you grew up with Tolkien, and you love Middle Earth, and you remember where everything is, and you recognize all the maps, this book is great. Because I have a physical copy of it, so I can't flip through it for you. This book is really, really good because it tracks all the different characters from all the different little novels that they wrote. Like you can see where, you know, <laughs> where Regis the Halfling was, and you can see where Dritz and Brunner went to Mithril Hall, and everything, right? And it has little isometric views and cutaway views of different temples and churches and city maps. I mean, it's like a campaign guide in of itself. It's not just maps. It has lots of written information there, too, and backstory. It's really, really great. A lot of people don't like the Forgotten Realms. I actually don't have a problem with it because it's so much more detailed than you get in Greyhawk. Greyhawk is cool. It's the original, but Forgotten Realms really took it to 11 with all the novels and the stories. Are you keeping up with me so far? So you got three reprints. Definitely get Fiend Folio. Get the Forgotten Realms Atlas preferred over any of the other ones. All right, let's go to the next slide here. There we go. So let's go through some of this stuff real basic here because if you're a fifth edition player, you're like, well, what do you get to do? And what's the classes? Okay, they have races dwarves, elves, gnomes, half elves, halflings, half orcs, and humans. What was that? Uh, there really is no expansion of DD in its core set that added new goofy races. Now, some people talk about Unearth Arcana. I completely skip Unearth Arcana. Some people love it. Some people hate it. It really was kind of transitioning into a second edition version of the game, so I don't really count it. And also, I'm leaning on nostalgia here, right? By the time that Unearth Arcana came out in like 1985, we were already set in our ways of what we were playing D&D. &D. We didn't need Cavaliers and things like that. But if you're playing the core book, the core books like we're talking about here, those are the races you're going to have. Now, those races have impact on the game, which is very different than what you see in 5th edition or in Pathfinder. You have ability score minimums and maximums. So when you're rolling the dice and picking which type of race you're going to be, you might see you know, the minimum dexterity for a halfling or the maximum charisma for a dwarf. So you have to look at all these different charts and say, well, gosh, here's my numbers. What, 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 what can I play? What would work for me? So it's kind of reversed. In modern day, we have these like, make whatever you want, come with a cool theme and go wee. Right? It's not like that. In the old days, you're kind of like, okay, I'm a, kind of... A, I'm kind of controlled by the dice here. I've got to play some kind of interesting character based on what the, what the gods have given me, right? And there's class restrictions. Certain classes can play one class. Other other races, excuse me, other races can't play certain classes. So you're like, hmm, gnome illusionist. You aren't going to be playing a half-orc illusionist, that's for sure. And then there's level limits. In the original AD&D, you have things like this, this race can only get to level seven as a cleric. That stuff's very limiting. In later years, that all went away. Everything in the game has just improved, improved, and changed, and changed, and changed. It made much less limiting. But if you go back and play it this way, you're talking about 15,000 years of gameplay here. <laughs> it's not going to really kill you. It's just going to make you make more interesting decisions and force you to play a kind of character and really try to breathe life into it as if you're picking a character and plucking them from a book and throwing them on the table. Uh, there is multi-classing. There's a lot of multi-classing. You know, thief, magic user, fighter, thief, magic user. You can have up to three multi-classes. There's rules for that. Certain of these non-human races get to do this more than others. Um, and they have a lot of innate abilities, like the, the ability to see sloping passageways or the ability to be really great with long swords and long bows, or et cetera, et cetera. So each one of the races has things about them that set them apart from the others beyond just the lore and the character and some of the implied relationships. They even have a, a table that shows you, you know, which races get along with others. Like half-orcs, you know, they can tolerate humans, but they don't like anyone else. And dwarves can't stand elves. So a lot of that stuff is kind of Tolkien-oriented. You know, you have to pick up from these different uh, ideas that were lifted and they kind of reuse in AD&D. &D. Now the classes, there's cleric, druid, fighter, paladin, ranger, magic user, illusionist, 
thief, assassin, monk, and bard, right? So what's very interesting about this? Cleric, the druid's considered a subclass of the cleric. The fighter, the paladin, the ranger is considered a subclass of the fighter. The illusionist is considered a subclass of the magic user. The assassin is considered a subclass of the thief. But you don't start off as a thief and then turn into an assassin. You don't start off as a fighter and become a paladin like you might see in other versions of the game where you're getting these different, like Paragon Pass, like I was talking about the other day in the fourth edition. You don't have that kind of stuff. What you do is you have ability score requirements to even meet the criteria. It's like you're getting into law school or getting into medical school. You're not going to be an illusionist if you have low dexterity, right? You can be a magic user and have crap dexterity. So there's a lot of interesting choices you have to make. So when you're creating your character in D&D, it really anchors on what do my ability scores allow me to become? And this is very tricky because you may be like, hey, I want to play an illusionist. Well, if you don't have the stats for it, how are you going to play it? So you may have to work with your DM and say, hey, listen, I want to play an illusionist no matter what. Can um, can we roll a matrix of six by six, you know, 36 sets of stats, and I can pick and choose from some of them. Or maybe he's going to give them to you, okay? So that's how the classes work. Now, I'm not going to go through every single class. I'm just trying to give you a snapshot here. You're thinking about getting into it. You haven't made the leap yet. That's what this video is about. Things about classes that are very different, especially in games like Pathfinder and 4th Edition and so on and so on, everyone has what's called hit dice. And this is the dice you would roll to determine your hit points. Like a ranger is hit dice D8, and a fighter is D10, and a magic user's illusion is only D4. Even the monk is only D4. Imagine being level 18. The average hit points of a monk is 36 at level 18. You know, the average half of their hit dice, right? That's very tricky. Now, don't freak out because I got some house rules in the back here that you can use in Lyft that makes it feel a little more transitionally functional for people that modern day gamers, right? Um, there's armor and weapon restrictions by class. There's special class abilities, you know, like turn and dead and do all kinds of neat things. And there's alignment restrictions. You can't play this class unless you're truly neutral, etc. And every one of the classes that are spellcasters, they have their own unique spell list. There aren't spell schools like primal and divine and stuff like that it is like this is the illusionist spell book this is the magic user spell book now they do have some of the same spells like light for example like both magic user and the cleric have that there's also experience point requirements to level up and the table is different like for example clerics can go all the way to 29 and some other classes can only go to like level 12 so that's a different kind of idea way back in the day if i were to speculate because i was just a little kid in middle school when this came out I would say that they were trying to come up with some kind of balance, knowing that at really high levels are people passing like gate and heal and harm, that these classes weren't going to go through the roof. But who knows? And there's level maxes, like I just mentioned. Let's keep going. Time. Okay, let's talk about the mechanics of the game. This is where it all began, right? In the beginning, in AD&D, you had a turn that's 10 rounds. A turn was one minute. Excuse me. A turn was 10 minutes. So a round was one minute long. Now remember the game came from kind of a wargaming background, right? In war games, in some games like Traveler, the, the time that you play when you do something is really long. A segment would be a subset of a round, which would be six seconds. So over the years, we can all see now that today, a melee round or a round is just six seconds. And then everything else changes. The reason why you need to pay attention to time, because when you look at all the spells, every single spell is broken down by how long it takes to cast it. And some of them take a round, some of them take turns, some of them take two rounds, some of them only take a few segments. So that's something you have to keep in mind. When we come to my house rules later on, you see how I've kind of collapsed all that into something much more simple. The old school rules as written people will hate my house rules, but it may help you if you're making a transition and you really don't want to have to break every convention they're used to. Movement's another thing, movement and measurement. You know, they use this double tick mark everywhere, right? Like inches. And if you were an architect or writing a piece of uh, construction document, you'd write 12, you know, two hash marks. That means inches. One hash mark means a foot. Well, the game wasn't oriented around miniatures yet. Even though Grenadier and Ralph Pollard released a lot of great miniatures back in those days, the, uh, no, I'm not walking the woods. It's a background sound effects from the music. The, uh, it sounds like someone eating a candy bar, but it's not. It's someone walking in the woods, some Viking. Um, so 12 inches means 120 feet in a round. 
which is really a minute. So you can only move 12 feet in a segment. That's half as far as you can move today. My house rules kind of address that. But remember, if you're looking at these old D&D modules and dungeons, all the squares are 10 feet. It's almost always theater of the mind. The players are making the map. There is no dry erase marker boards and battle maps. So when this game was first written, you know, you, the players had to draw the map themselves. The DM might say, you enter a 30 by 30 room and there's a lone casket sitting in the middle of the chamber. That's, that's a room in White Plume Mountain. And it's completely covered in darkness. And only the person with, you know, ultra vision can see this etc all right let's move on surprise and initiative this is another kind of strange thing about ad and d and don't let all these little strange things put you off because the amount of lore and adventures and fun to be had in this game and how fast it is to play and how easy it is to understand is incredible that's why they never published like 85 books if you look at any of the modern versions of all the role-playing games it's like Campaign guide, player campaign guide, Monster Manual 45, you know, player handbook 14. Oh, they just keep doing this. So in D&D, you only use a D6 to determine initiative, and you only use a D6, one of them, to determine surprise. Surprise is kind of like anyone who rolls a 1 or a 2 is going to be surprised. And some classes like a ranger couldn't be surprised except on a 1. What would happen is people would roll the two D6s, one for one party, one for the other, and you would actually determine who's surprised. It wouldn't be like the game master says, up ahead you see some goblins, it looks like they're dorking around a, a cart, and everyone in your party says, well, we're going to try to be really quiet and slink along the shadows of these tree lines to get the jump on them. Like, that wouldn't matter as much. Technically, on paper, the moment of truth, when you pull out your bow to aim at those goblins by that you know wagon or something, you'd have to roll a surprise check. Now, your dexterity has a big impact on surprise. There's a thing called um, reaction attacking adjustment. So the reaction adjustment part of that would bolster your surprise number. I mean, a high number is good. And then you would compare, hey, I rolled a six, your side rolled a two, the difference is four, and you could see how many segments, remember, which is six seconds, you could act before they could do anything. The other day I made this fourth edition guide, and you remember how powerful surprise was, if you've seen it already? If you haven't, check out my fourth edition playlist down below. If you have surprise in fourth edition, the people that are surprised can't even act, okay? Very crazy. Initiative, D6, high number wins. You know, there's some writing in page 61 or so in the DM guide that explains about how, well, you have a bunch of players over here and a bunch of monsters over here, and the players might have henchmen or men-at-arms. So that's kind of three groups, right? You can do this however you wish to do. There's nothing in the reaction attacking adjustment that boosts your initiative number, but in my house rules there are. Okay, we'll move on from here. Combat. So unlike having, you know, to hit AC0 Thaco in second edition, or having a base attack bonus like in D&D &D 3.5 and Pathfinder 1, or having a number that starts with 10 plus half your level, all these things that happened over the years, right? You just look up the number to hit based on your opponent's armor class. And armor class in D&D, &D, 10 was wearing nothing, 2 was wearing plate mail and shield, and below that became like magical. No one really had 0 or negative 1 or negative 2. The lower the number, the better it is. So like Demogorgons, like armor class negative 8 naturally, okay? So your number to hit is based on your class and the armor class of your target and your level. So clerics, druids, and monks would use a table that's up here in the upper left-hand corner, right? So you could just take a quick look here. Say you're level 10 cleric. Your chance to hit armor class 0 person is 14. Over here is the magic user illusionist table. If you're a level 10 magic user illusionist, it takes a 19 to hit armor class 0. If you're a fighter, paladin, ranger, bard, or level 0 halflings and humans, if you're level 10, to hit armor class 0, it's only a 12. And for thieves and assassins, it's a 16. <clears throat> Excuse me. So your class makes a big difference. If you think about it and really analyze it, fighters, rangers, and paladins have the best to hit number, followed by clerics, druids, and monks. And then that's followed by thieves and assassins, and lastly, magic users and illusionists, who aren't very martial oriented anyway. Um, they also had rules for assassinating and killing someone flat out. That's kind of house ruled a lot. Not many people used the rules. It would be like you're sent on a mission, you come back, a percentage chance to do it, like you would see in the World of Warcraft expansion where they had like sending minions out to do missions. But monsters, their chance to hit is based upon their hit dice, right, and their level versus your armor class. So, of course, the lower your armor class, the better, the less likely you'll be hit. But all monsters in the game, whether it's a dragon or an orc or a deep gnome or a drow, what level are they? That's based on their hit dice. You don't say it's a level 7 dragon or a level 14 dragon. You might say it's a hit dice 14 dragon. You might have a situation where Ogre Magi is hit dice this plus that. So those hit dice numbers for monsters are always a D8. 
right, when you're rolling their hit points. And you'll see in a lot of the old A&D modules, they'll say, in this room are three uh, hill giant females cooking in a kitchen. Uh, you know, AC7, hit points 22, 34, and 17. Their hit points will be all over the place, right? So the hit points are always a large range of numbers. It's not like, oh, uh, you look at Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and you'll say, oh, Frost Giant, 170 hit points. That's just a way the game evolved. They went for s every single Frost Giant would have the exact same. I don't know the number. I'm not quoting the real number, but I'm just saying it's a fixed number. So in AD&D, there is this large variety of numbers that the monsters could have. Just because a level 4 drow fighter attacked you doesn't necessarily mean he has 40 hit points, right? He might just have 17 or 22 or 30. So that's something to think about. Monsters don't have as much incredible hit points. They don't have as much incredible armor class. What they do have is numbers and special abilities. So players, they have almost like in an MMO, you have frontline fighters and DPS happening, heavy armor wearers with fighters, paladins, and rangers, followed up by clerics, druids, and monks, thieves, and assassins, skulking in the shadows to backstab, who do double, triple, and quadruple damage based on how they do it, right, which is really nasty. I mean, thieves, and assassins, quadruple damage from a surprise backstab, okay? Quadruple, okay? <laughs> so, and then magic user Lucius, who aren't doing any martial attacks, they're the, they're the ones at the very end. So this is something about combat that's very interesting. And when you cast spells, everything's a saving throw. There's none that's like rolling to hit with a spell. So on the right, there's no powers. There's no feats. There's no attack of opportunity. There's no conditions. You're not doomed and dying and all this kind of crap. All the combat is what your creative imagination is. So you would say things like, okay, um, so you said there's two orcs coming through the doorway and there's like a drow priestess in the back. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to run to the right and try to get in the face of the drow priestess to keep her from casting spells, but I'll keep my shield to the side so if the orcs turn towards me, I can turn and defend myself. Like, that's what you would actually say while you're playing. You wouldn't move a miniature off across the board and go past the orc and provoke an attack of opportunity and then get hit and then have the drow priestess roll to hit a spell against your willpower and have her miss and have you make a save. Like, all those complexities, they just aren't there. You're just basically describing what you're doing, and the dungeon master would mitigate. So, okay, that's fine. You're defending against the orcs, and you're trying to attack the drow priestess go ahead and roll to hit her her ac is four and you you know you're a level 10 fighter you're trying to hit ac4 you only need an eight or higher to hit you get a plus two weapon you need a six you're probably going to nail her right so combat was much more simplistic magic spells were very very powerful so if you can get that spell off you might find a situation where your whole person charmed knocked down the ground burned to the death so that's a bit that's pretty much the main thing about combat that's so different uh, one thing about, I want to mention about AD&D that's so magical, especially for us nostalgic guys like me, is just the enemies. There's just so many interesting enemies. Some of them are NPCs, like this party on the right from the uh, Assault of the Slave Lord series, A1, A2, A3, and A4. These are like the final bosses. Or these Githyanki on the left, they're silver swords, a party of Githyanki attacking the players. This is from Ross from the Fiend Folio. You know, there were no Githyanki or Githsarai or Drow or Bugbears or any of that crap until they come up with it first in Advanced Dungeon Dragon. So everything, all these years, you know, 87 to 97, that's 10 years. You yeah. <laughs> know, 87 to 97, 10 years. That's 20 years. 2007, 30 years. 2017, 40 years. I mean, and now it's 2023. It's like 46, 47, almost 50 years since all these creative ideas have been on the table. So if you want to really go back and play, like if you want to go back and read The Lord of the Rings, read the first books, right? The original books. Don't read some rewrite book of the, of the movie, right? You get the real book. You know, there's something very special about listening to the first Led Zeppelin album, you know, not listening to some cover band do a copy of it. So if you want to go back and get the original stuff where the original cool magic of ideas come from, that's what the magic is of AD&D. Let's keep going. Here's another element. I mentioned how many crazy enemies there are. Oh my gosh, when it comes to monsters, this is just screenshots. So don't try to click anything. <laughs> I mean, if you just go to the DM, the Dungeon Masters Guild, and sort by first edition, which you can see I sorted it right down here, and I just said I want D&D Classics, which means the ones released by TSR. There's tons and tons of these $4.99, $9.99 cheap adventures. I mean, these things cost a, like a dollar more than they did back in 1980. Against the Slave Lords, Village of Homlet, Vault of the Drow, Queen of Demon Pits, Desert of Desolation series, Against the Giants, all these big names that you've seen, you know, Neverwinter and all that kind of junk is in the Forgotten Realms, they're all there. It's like pages upon pages upon pages. There must be at least a hundred adventures, many of them that would take you a whole summer to play through. And I spelled the word adventures wrong, so you can tease me about that. 
house rules. I said I would do this at the end. If you've seen everything you need to see, you can stop at the video now. That's cool. I'm not offended. I just want you to have a good time. Hopefully you got a good sense of what you need to get started and where to go to get things. If you don't understand something, leave a comment below and I'll always reply. I always try to make sure that I can respond to anyone who says anything unless you just say something nasty and you, I don't respond to that. So, you know, Osric is the old school system reference index com compilation. You, it's free. Now, it doesn't have everything in AD&D and and it was really created by Stuart Marshall and some other folks to allow guys like me to make an AD&D adventure and release it for on the internet commercially and sell it without getting in trouble with Wizards of the Coast. And what it did, it compiled the original OGL and a bunch of rules, but it had to pull out a lot of elements that were in the original books. I don't recommend you try to play AD&D with Osric. It's missing a lot of stuff, right? But if you have the books and you have Osric, you can still get away with playing pretty well. But I reference page numbers in this section. So if you're really paying attention here, right? And there's a blog entry on my website that has the same information on it. Max hit points. So I suggest that instead of rolling the hit points your players, characters, and enemies, simply just give them max hit points. That means a level 10 monster is going to have level 10, not level 10, but hit dice 8 monster is 80 hit points. Level 8 you know, fighter with constitution bonus of plus 2 is going to be 12 times 8 is 96. Why do I say that? Combat will take a little longer. It'll be a little bit more tactical. People that are low hit points will have a better chance of survival. People that are higher hit points will be able to go face to face with the monsters that now have a higher level hit points. So this is a, a fun way to make some of the fights feel more impactful and more exciting. Now, why would you want to do that? Because when you're describing the fight, you're using your imagination more than anything. Remember how I talked about how like I'm approaching the drow priestess and I'm keeping my shield to the left so the orcs try to attack me? Like, you know, you might have a situation where you've got to hit her two or three times to kill her, and she's in your face. The orcs try to attack you and bring you to the ground. I mean, you want those things to evolve. You want the dungeon master, gosh, how am I going to mitigate this? These guys are trying to attack you. Let me do like a flat-footed roll to check type thing, you know? So the next thing you should change, just go ahead and change everything to the six-second melee round. We all know that this rule is adopted in every single edition ever since, right? Um, my players love it. It already makes sense to them. Now, what that does is that changes spells, Okay. You see a spell listed with a cast time in segments, like Incendiary Cloud or Extension 3. Just round it up to one segment, right? And just call it a melee round. Six second melee round. Any cast time that said turns remains the same. So if you see a spell that says like clone or contact other planes that takes one turn, which means 10 minutes, leave those at 10 minutes. Every other spell, make it take one melee round to cast, okay? It's really straightforward. It's not that big of a deal. Movement rate. You know, we saw those weird tick marks with 12-inch and 6-inch movement rates. Just change the base 12-inch movement rate to be 25 feet. That way you can use a battle map with 5-foot squares for this new 6-second melee round. It'll flow. It'll feel meaningful. you have a good sense of how far you can move. If you're using any battle maps you have now, that's fine. And have the DM, you have a creature like a Lamia that has a really high movement rate, just make it a little longer and use your judgment. Like change her 25 feet to 50, right? Or weird cases, just use increments of 5 feet. Initiative. Instead of rolling a single d6 and comparing the difference in terms of segments, which we don't have anymore, just roll 3d6 for everyone, and the high number wins. Allow people to add their surprise bonus to that roll, right? You want a situation where someone rolls, you know, 3, 6, 6, and that's going to be a 3, 4, 4, right? Every millisecond counts, but when you're rolling initiative, you can do whatever you want. You can't, you, sure, you could use a d20 if you want to. That's fine, too. But Go ahead and allow you with high dexterity to get that reaction bonus that's usually applied to surprise. I find that makes it feel more meaningful because what you're going to end up doing, like in most D&D games or Divinity Original Sin or Baldur's Gate, is there's going to be an initiative order where the rogue gets to go, then the monk gets to go, then the cleric, then the druid, and then the orc, and then the drow priestess, right? So the person that has high dexterity is probably going to be able to react first. It might give them a chance to slip away and hide in shadows. Attacking and moving... In one melee round, remember it's now six seconds, an enemy can move and attack and make a partial movement and attack and then move away. For example, if I, I can move 10 feet and then move 15 feet after that, or I can move 10 feet, attack, and then move 15 feet after that. And <clears throat> if characters that have more than one attack per melee round, give them freedom how to divide that up. Like they might pull out a bow, shoot the bow, pull, put the bow away, move 10 feet, attack with a melee weapon, pull the shield up and back away. And that's a lot of free actions, but it really helps someone feel really interesting and powerful. Spell recovery. 
You remember in fourth edition of the video we did the other day, we talked about the short rest and the long rest and all this kind of stuff where you can get your counter powers and daily powers back. I found that just a 10 minute rest is plenty of time for someone to regain their memorized spells because in AD and D you're like memorizing the same spell three and four times. So I was like, Oh, I have magic missile memorized four times and cure light wounds measured three times. It's kind of strange. That's the best, most simplistic way to keep it the same without changing it and putting a spell point or a mana system in the game, which you don't really need. So instead of having to camp and rest for eight hours, because nothing ever happens except wandering monsters anyway, just have it be a 10 minute rest, but it has to be completely uninterrupted. And that means all the spells, right? So if you want to heal the whole party, I'd pick your rest 10 minutes, heal everyone up because there's no medicine skill or anything like that. The next one is a uh, critical hit versus a flub. A natural 20 is always a hit and it's always a critical hit and it always does double damage because you're only talking about 5% chance for that to happen anyway and everyone needs an exciting moment in the game. And the way the, the numbers are lined up with the armor class, it's not that big of a deal because you're not having people roll a 20 with plus 17 to it like you say in Pathfinder or even 4E. 20s don't come up very often. So looking at the die while it's rolling and hoping it's a 20 is exciting. If, a ro if you roll a 1, it's always a flub. It means you miss, you potentially lose your balance, you fall down, you overstep, you lunge. All kinds of interesting, embarrassing things. Let the GM decide what's appropriate. Like, for example, if you're standing on top of a bed like Ella Fenisi was, who was a monk in um, the Standing of the Hill Giant Chief, she tried to run and jump from one bed to the next bed, which were giant-sized beds, and attack this one hill giant who was getting up out of bed. The hill giant getting out of bed went like, huh, like that, and she rolled a 1. So the GM, which was me, said if she slipped and fell on the floor and busted her face on the edge of the bed. That kind of stuff is inventive and imaginative. So you let those dice create those magical moments for really bad things and really good things. Ability score checks. You know, sometimes you kind of want to use an ability score check. There's no knowledge in Arcana or any of that other crap that you have in the later versions of the game. You don't have to have a special skill with a gnome in the back. Can't do anything because all he knows how to do is pick locks. What you can do is just do something like from Mega Traveler or even from Decimation or other games. Make a difficulty ranking from easy, simple, difficult, extremely difficult. And then you just roll different types of dice to simulate that. For example, something easy. Roll 3d6 underneath your ability score. The DM says, well, you want to convince the other members of the party that you think the map is fake. And no matter what, you know, uh, if you roll your charisma or less, you're going to be very persuasive. And everyone's going to believe you, right? There's no saving throw for the party. That's a good way to do that kind of stuff. Or you're having a player character interact with an NPC. There's no reacting table or anything like that to do, right? There's no DC to go up against. Simple. Roll a D20 under the key ability score. The mean's only a 10. Difficult. Roll 4D6 under the key ability score. The mean is 10. Extremely difficult. Roll 5D6 under the key ability score. The mean's 12.5. So basically what you're trying to do here is you're trying to find some kind of way for something to happen that feels like a DC check, but it's related to your ability score. And then the game master or dungeon master can say, hmm, you know what, that really seems to be kind of like a wisdom, like how wise you are check. Uh, the, this guard's telling you a bluff story about how, oh, we close the gates at sundown, which isn't actually true. Maybe they only close the gates at 10 o'clock at night. You know, those are the kinds of situations where I got to make up a rule here to determine whether it's success. I want the player to roll the dice. So that's another house rule that you can do. The facing direction and flanking one, you know, I always firmly believe that everyone has a 180 degree field of facing direction. And if you get attacked from behind, you lose any kind of shield or dexterity bonus to your armor class. And the attacker gets plus two to hit, which is very similar to fourth edition's, um, oh gosh, what's the darn name of their attack? I forgot what it was. There's a name for when you attack someone from behind in that game. Oh, what is it? I, I forgot. I forgot the damn word. So sorry. Anyway, in, in fourth edition, that's all over the place. This plus two to hit. Oh, what the hell is a damn thing? I feel like running and getting my book and looking it up. I won't. But don't worry about it. Let me give you an a, a, a example. Let's say level 5 thief Rigen uh, may have swung around wide and got behind one of the orcs in a previous scenario and attacked, but the GM might say the orc's aware of this movement and takes a 5 foot 1 step to ensure he's not flanked. So this is one thing that's very funny. Because you have a you go, I go, he goes, you go situation, people don't just stand there and face the wrong way while you walk up and get behind them and try to backstab them. If they're aware of you moving around them, they'd be able to turn and defend themselves. So that facing direction with the miniature is really, really important. Let's go here to Attack of Opportunity. I've got a great example on this. If you want to put Attack of Opportunity in the game in one step, here's the way I think you need to do it, right? Any player character or monster that tries to move past a player character or monster within reach provokes the Attack of Opportunity unless they clearly state they're moving defensively. 
This allows the player of the game master to describe the actions that are realistic as opposed to an absolute. Like in the rules for 3.5 and 4, this attack opportunity says, oh, you're, you're leaving the square. You, you provoked an attack opportunity. I'm rolling to hit you. But that doesn't happen. It depends on how you clearly state your movement. Simply just moving in out of the square of the enemy and performing an action and casting a spell provokes an attack of opportunity. So here's how you do it. Let's say originally the level 5 thief and Lachlan level 4 fighter are engaged in fighting a pair of orcs in the center of a 20 by 20 room. Lachlan attacks one orc and both orcs return the favor. When it's Ridgen turn, he says, I want to run to the door and open it. Now it's clear he wants to run past a pair of orcs fighting a comrade in order to get to the door. He traces his movement adjacent to one of the orcs. In this situation, the orc he passes can make an attack of opportunity, and Ridgen loses any dexterity bonus to his AC. This is because of the way he stated the action. He did not clarify how careful or thoughtful his movement was. Instead, he might say, I want to run to the door and open it, but I'll keep my blade drawn and my eye on the orc in case they try and take a swing at me. So in that situation, the orc sees you and you see him, and maybe he decides to stay on his original target, or maybe he tries to hit you. But he doesn't get a free attack of opportunity. It might be a situation where you run past the orc and faint like you're going to hit him and make him rule and react, and then you just run past him. So that's what AD&D is all about. It's all about how you actually describe your actions. How do you make the table come alive without having to flip through the rule book that's 720 pages long? So we also talked about reach. You know, pole arms can only reach beyond five feet. You got to use your judgment when the monsters are really big, like frost giants and class E demons. So the last thing is, we always consider it fair for people to say they're going to disengage from combat defensively and making positional adjustments like the one step, but they got to kind of describe it and say it, right? If someone's like, I'm attacking the frost giant, but I want to get around this guy to get to this drow priestess. Uh, I want to kind of like faint like I'm attacking and slip right past the guy. And the GM, I said, okay, you make this faint and hmm, let's see, maybe he'll roll a d20 with a 10 or higher or something just to get a 50% chance. He sees you make the faint, but he ignores it just so you slip past him. Like that makes it feel... Like the GM is improvising and making it cool and feel exciting. And you're coming up with an exciting action. The GM's giving you an exciting result. Last thing I want to rant and rave about. TPK. BBEG. Session zero. I had to make a new character. They, they derailed my story. They killed my BBEG. All right. I'm not going to go off too much on a tangent. When someone in your party dies... There are spells in the game called Raise Dead and Resurrection. And local priests of the different gods in Greyhawk and in the Forgotten Realms are usually pretty high level. And this is what they do for a living. <laughs> they have a flock of followers that live in the village, that live in the county. They've gotten to this position and settled down and stop adventuring. They're not always ex-Federal Express employees that work at a copy center, right? Just because someone in the modern world is a priest or a rabbi or whatever they have, it doesn't mean that they didn't spend years getting ready for this. Think about this from the Middle Ages perspective, right? Priests in the game, which are clerics, right? And maybe sometimes druids, they know how to cast spells. What would they want? A tithe? Would they want to know whether you're a follower of the same faith? Would they want you to do something for them to help them with the problem they have first? Get your comrade the hell out of there like a Marine in Afghanistan and get your comrade resurrected. This is a character someone will spend years playing. Dumping the character because there's a TPK. You know, that's ridiculous. If you're fighting to the death and banging your head against the wall like a lemming, yeah, you sure, all of you deserve to die, right? Think tactically, have fun. You don't want Frodo to die. We don't want Sam to die. We don't want Gandalf to die, right? You don't want Aragorn to die. If those guys just banged their head against the wall and didn't use intelligent movements fighting the cave troll, they would be dead. So use resurrection as a tool in the game. There's stats in the game related to your constitution that tells whether you even survive being resurrected. You know, have Belit res Conan, right? It always drives me batty when the people think about these absolute situations. If you're playing an MMO, sometimes there is a wipe, right, in a raid. That's because that is a tank healer DPS game. If healers aren't spamming heals and in the right spot and the tanks aren't doing their best with their mitigation and standing in the right spots, they die and once aggro is lost in the tank, they start killing DPSers and the healers die. That's because that's the relationship because there's aggro. There's a hate list. You don't have, and that's from Daiku Muds, you don't have that in D&D. Someone can say, oh crap, I'm getting the hell out of here and run down, run away. <laughs> so use resurrection as a tool to make your heroes become heroes and live forever, right? Maybe not on the spot. Maybe you need to bail out of the fight and figure out a way to get back in there and get your comrade out of there. 
All right, that's enough ranting and raving about that. I don't want to hear TPK ever again from anyone in AD&D because there's no real reason to have it unless you jump into the sphere of annihilation at the end of the hallway at the Tomb of Horrors and you deserve it. So that's pretty much all I wanted to cover today. I hope you had fun listening along and having uh, you know think about it. But if you want to get back into AD&D, feel free to um, ask any questions. If you want to know how to find anything, and uh, I hope you have fun. It's an incredible game. It has so much fun adventure there to be had. It's not complicated. You could have an AD&D game with your kids, and they would love it. All the magic of adventuring is there just waiting for you, and it costs hardly anything. Take care. We'll see you later. <laughs>